All right, well, I have six o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I know there's a lot of returning folks tonight. I'm glad to have you back. For those of you who are new to the Ag in the Evening series, we welcome you. And if you don't know who I am, my name is Dr. Jason Banta. I'm the Extension Beef Cattle Specialist stationed at the Overton Research and Extension Center. Tonight's topic is a little different, but it's one that's very important from a, a livestock standpoint. And we're gonna talk about fencing considerations and there's not a, a right or wrong, but there are some things that work better than others. So hopefully I can lay a little framework tonight of some things that generally work better for, for some folks. And we'll talk about both some permanent fence considerations as well as some temporary fence considerations. And as I mentioned, a lot of that depends on, are we talking about a temporary fence? And typically we're talking about electric there. Are we talking about a more permanent fence installation? And one of the big things that's gonna impact some of our choices is gonna be what species are we gonna be dealing with? So are we strictly dealing about cattle? Do we wanna have the flexibility to have both cattle as well as small ruminants. And if we're dealing with small ruminants, obviously we're dealing what we would, with what we would call field fence or net wire. And one thing to keep in mind with sheep and goats is, especially if they have horns, you need to think about the size of the opening. So you either want the opening small enough so they can't put their head through and get stuck or big enough so they can put their head through and easily get it back out. And then for a lot of us, uh, wild pigs have become an issue, and there are some things we can do from a fence standpoint that may not stop them, but can definitely help reduce travel across property, depending on how you're set up or keeping them out of certain areas of the property. And then there's other reasons we may want to fence on that property. So when we think about type of fences, there's a lot of different types out there. So obviously pipe, and that's something we typically think about more from a corral or working pen standpoint, or, or maybe around or near a house from an aesthetic standpoint. I uh, really won't spend much time, on, or much time on pipe fences tonight, but that is an option. If you have questions, feel free to ask. Uh, we'll spend some time on what we call net wire or field fence. Field fence is kind of the new term. Um, sometimes you see those used interchangeably. Sometimes you see field fence used more depending on the hinge of the joint, and we'll talk about that. Uh, bob wire is something that a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, smooth wire, typically from a cattle standpoint, we don't think about that a lot, uh, but if you do have horses, that's something you may be dealing with. Uh, electric fence, we may see that in combination uh, with a permanent fence or maybe by itself, and so we'll, we'll talk about that as well. So just a few comments on field fence versus bob wire before we get started. Uh, I'll just tell you from personal experience, the last permanent fences we built were all field fence or net wire. Very happy we made that decision. Uh, made that decision for a couple reasons. Uh, cost was one, it was actually cheaper than bob wire or, or similar to bob wire, depending on how you were gonna price it out and build a bob wire. Um, we did it from a wild pig standpoint to help reduce some pressure there and, and been very happy with that. And then one benefit I really didn't think about when we built it, but it's been really nice is those baby calves just don't crawl through that net wire fence like they build a bob wire fence. So you, you can kind of keep them where you want them and don't have to worry about them crawling through the fence and going and looking at them from time to time as you can have with a bob wire fence. Um, one downside to the field fence that you just have to be aware of, it's not a big deal, there's some, some easy enough management around it, but if you do have some areas that flow a little bit of water, um, that net wire field fence will grab a whole lot more of especially Bermuda grass or other grasses than what bob wire will, so you have to think about that. And in those low areas that have a little bit of water flow to them, I'm not talking about a true water gap, but just a low area with the little water flow, you may need to raise that field fence up just a little bit so you don't get all that grass caught on it. And that's just something you can uh, put in and then decide um, on a case by case basis how you need to set that up. One thing I wanted to mention is wire diameter, and this is very important uh, from a selection standpoint and a cost standpoint. So just like when we're talking about needles, the smaller number, the bigger the gauge. So 
nine gauge is going to be bigger than 11, 11 is going to be bigger than 14 and a half, and then you can see how that goes. Uh, typically, especially with a high tensile fence, we'll be looking at 14 or 12 and a half gauge. With low tensile, we'll be looking at nine to 12 and a half gauge. And so just remember the, the smaller the number, the bigger around the diameter of the wire. Another thing to think about wire, whether we're talking about bob wire or field fence or even smooth wire is the carbon content. And, and that's really when we're talking about high tensile wire or low tensile wire, or, or, or maybe another name for low tensile wire is low carbon wire. And so when we're talking about low carbon wire, we're typically talking about wire that has roughly about 0.28% carbon content. This is going to be the wire a lot of us are familiar with. Uh, it does have more stretch. If you're going to be building with it, whether it's bob wire or net wire, uh, really probably want to think about building during the summer. If you build that during really cold weather during the winter, when we get into the summer, sometimes we do see a little more sag in that fence. So that's something to think about because it does have more stretch in the wire itself. We have to put more tension on it and so that means there is a little more strain on the corners. Uh, it is easier to work with uh, because it's not high tensile, uh, but there's, there's some pros and cons there. When we look at that high tensile wire, the carbon content typically is gonna be around 0.64%. It's gonna have a higher breaking strength and we'll look at that in a minute. It does have a whole lot less stretch to it. Uh, so you don't have to worry about so much time a year if you do build it in cold weather because it doesn't have that stretch, it won't sag as much when we get into the heat of the summer. And because we don't have to put as much tension on it, it typically doesn't put as much strain on those corners. Uh, but it is a little bit harder to work with, or I should say it has a little more of a learning curve to work with. So when we look at breaking strength, and uh, this is some data I adapted from one of the company publications. Uh, if we look at 12 and a half gauge high tensile wire that they were using, so that's going to be, you know, pretty thick wire, um, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,250 pounds of breaking strength. If we look at 14 gauge high tensile wire, so a little thin, thinner wire between uh, 500 and 750 pounds of breaking strength, and if we look at 12 and a half gauge traditional low carbon wire, which is like bob wire, a lot of us would be familiar with, you can see it's a little lower. So when we're dealing with a high tensile wire, we can actually go to a smaller gauge wire and have more breaking strength, meaning it's gonna be harder to break that wire. And that's beneficial when we're building fence because we can go with that smaller gauge that saves on weight and that will save on cost as well. So just some differences there from a comparison standpoint you can look at. If you're looking, if you're wanting some more information on that, there's a really nice YouTube video uh, by Beekert out there. If you'll just Google that title uh, in a YouTube search that says breaking strength of Beekert high tensile wire, they kind of walk through that and, and show you how that's tested and, and some of the differences with the different wire there. In addition to gauge and carbon content, tensile, or excuse me, PSI differences can have some differences on breaking strength, but just to kind of look at some more numbers, a lot of times when, and this is all the same gauge wire, so low carbon wire, 12 and a half gauge, at least in this test, less than 600 uh, pounds, it would break. High tensile field fence greater than 1,000. High tensile fixed knot, uh, fence uh, about 1400 and we'll look at what we mean by fence uh, fixed knot here in a minute and then you can get some really high PSI high tensile uh, wire that sometimes we use in a permanent electric fence insulation uh, with a little more breaking strength there at around 1500 and, and that's due to that higher PSI for that. Another thing we have to think about is coating. So how much corrosion resistance are we going to have? And that's going to, the emphasis on that is always important, but obviously if we're along the Gulf Coast and near that salt water, it's even more important. 
But when we look at some of the options out there, um, and this was a lab test looking at some different options and they were looking at 12, 12, 12 and a half gauge wire, um, what would be commonly referred to as commercial wire. You can see had the, or commercial coating, I should say, had the least corrosion resistance. And there's really no industry standards uh, when it comes to just commercial, that generic term there. So that's important to keep in mind. If it is uh, identified as class one, there are some standards and, and you can see the resistance there. Class three is gonna have a more or thicker um, um, galvanized coating on it. And so you can see that's quite a bit bigger or quite a bit longer, I should say, as far as better corrosion resistance here. And then um, here, the last 20 or 30 years, we're starting to see more of what would be classified as zinc aluminum coating, as uh, so a zinc from the galvanized standpoint, but then also some aluminum in there uh, that gives, even, gives really good corrosion resistance. One thing to be aware of, though, a lot of times when we're dealing with zinc aluminum coating, it is thinner, so it's a little easier to rub that off. Um, so you kind of got to have to weigh the thickness versus uh, whether it's straight zinc or if it's a zinc aluminum. And so you can see a zinc aluminum class 20 would be very similar to just a straight class three galvanized. If we look at a class 40 zinc aluminum, it would be estimated to have about double the corrosion resistance of a ZA class 20 there. Different companies will use a little different terms. Sometimes this is gonna be very similar to what you just saw, but this would be some of the terminology uh, Stay Tough uses and how they kind of rank it. So just commercial grade uh, zinc galvanized coating, they would have at the bottom, they would kind of identify that as good. And then you can see the class one and class three uh, here. Now you can see a little difference here between the class three and the ZA versus the previous slide. And that's just some differences between company and then obviously the, the best corrosion uh, protection they offered if you wanted that uh, would be the ZA class 40 in that situation. So there's some different things to think about between low tensile, high tensile, different coatings on wire. That's gonna to apply to whether we're dealing with smooth wire, bob wire, or field fence. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on field fence. That's something maybe you may not be quite as familiar with. Um, and there has been some changes in that uh, versus what a lot of us grew up with. And the big change there has been what's called a fixed knot versus the traditional hinge knot. And this knot is very important because with the fixed knot, um, that field fence, if something gets on it, when you take that pressure off, will come back up or it's real easy to straighten it back up and it really resists bending and going down compared to that traditional hinge knot. Um, so there is a little bit more cost there, but because of the technology they have, it's not near what it used to be. If you are gonna be thinking about a uh, field fence or net wire fence, I would strongly encourage you to look at something with that fixed knot versus that hinge knot. I think you'll like it quite a bit more in the, in the long term. Uh, we do see what's called an S-knot sometimes in the equine industry. It would kind of be in between those. But when we look at something that's really robust, this fixed knot, it's going to give us the best performance out there. Now, when we look at net wire or field fence, there's kind of some terminology that different companies will use to describe it. Um, so if we look at this first one here, they call it a 949 six. What that means is nine means there's nine horizontal wires. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Versus if we look over here, it's a 13, you'd have 13 horizontal wires. So that first number, those first two numbers are going to tell you how many horizontal wires typically we're dealing with. The next two numbers is going to be the height. So this one here is 49 inches high. So if we added up all the differences, 
between these wires that would come to 49 or here we have more horizontal wires, but they're spaced closer together. They only come up to 48 inches. So the, the next number there is gonna be the height. And then the last number, so I mentioned like a 949.6, the six would tell me the distance between the vertical stays. So six inch spacing here. So this bottom hole would be six inches wide by five inches tall, six inches wide by five inches tall, six by six, six by six, six by six, six by seven. And so you can see a lot of these fences, the holes will be smaller at the bottom and they get a little bigger as we get towards the top. Um, they get bigger to help save on cost and weight of the product and then they're smaller at the bottom if we're trying to keep smaller animals in or if we're trying to keep pigs or other animals out. So that would be a 949.6. The next one here would be a 949.12. So that means there's 12 inches between the vertical stays there. And so for sheep or goats, this 949.12 would probably be better if they had horns than the 949.6, just because they can get in and out a little bit easier versus they may get stuck a little more here. And then, especially if it wasn't a perimeter fence or we were in areas that didn't have more as much pressure on it, uh, they, this company makes what they call a 949.12, meaning there's 12 inches of spacing between those vertical stays. So there's all kind of different combinations. When we look at the majority of the companies that are making a fixed knot fence, they'll use this similar nomenclature to describe the different fences. If we look at this one over here, 1348.6, so the six is just the space in between the vertical stays. We've already talked about the height and then 13 wires, so you can see they're just much closer together down there at the bottom. Now, typically when we talk about field fence or net wire, it'll either come in 330 foot rolls, 660 foot rolls, or sometimes you'll see it in, uh, like a 1,320 foot roll, but 330 will be the most common. The only time you'll see those bigger rolls is when those vertical stays are a little further apart. So the weight of that roll isn't quite as much. So some things to look at, if you're looking at company websites or if you're pricing some fence, make sure you're looking at this so you're always comparing the same or, or very similar type products. When we look at some of the manufacturers in this area that offer fixed knot fence, that would be Stay Tough, that would be uh, Beekert there, uh, Stay Tight 50, which is actually made uh, by Beekert for the San Antonio Steel Company um, out of, uh, or excuse me, yeah, for San Antonio Steel out of San Antonio there, and then OK Brands. So those, those three manufacturers would be the three most common in this area. If you're looking for some more information on field fences, most of the companies have some pretty good online resources. Just gonna highlight a few of these so you can download them at your convenience and look at them in more detail. Uh, Stay Tough has a, a nice publication on planning and installation guides. Uh, and I'll use some screenshots out of this a little bit later on, but if you're wanting the full publication, that, there it is. Uh, several of the companies, if you'll go to YouTube and search their company name and fence, there's a lot of different videos. So this is one I did just for Stay Tough. So they have how to build a fence. They actually did a testing video where they took a pickup truck and actually drove it into that fence to kind of show you the strength. And, and this was really interesting. Uh, it actually pulled the T-post out of the ground before it broke the wire there. Um, I know some people who live on corners or sharp curves that have a history of vehicles running through and into their fences. And, and some of them have gone to high tensile field fence and, and been very happy with it, where sometimes the vehicle ends up in the, in the pasture without a tear in the fence, just yanking those posts out of the ground. So things to be aware of. Uh, if you want to learn how to tie this up, because it is a little bit different than the the uh, low carbon or low tensile wire. Um, they have a video on that um, and just some other things as well. 
If we look at uh, Beekert there, they have several publications as well. This is one of them talking more about braces or corners. Uh, we'll look at it, some screenshots from it as well here in a minute. Um, one thing I did want to show you, they have a nice video talking about stretching this fence. And we stretch the high tensile fence a little bit different than low tensile. So most people with low tensile, you tie it off on one end, you go to the corners on the other end and you stretch that corner and then you tie it up. The recommendation by the companies, if you're dealing with a high tensile fence, especially the field fence, is to tie it off on both corners and then stretch it to the middle and splice it together in the middle there. So this is actually one of the stretching bars they use where you, you put it in there and then you, the, there's a little pin that the wire goes between the pin and the brace here. Um, and then they have devices for stretching that and then you, you splice it together in the middle. If you've never seen it before, I, I'll tell you the, the first time I saw it, I, I wasn't real sure, but after having a fair bit of that fence uh, put up and seeing it put up, it actually works really well. And you really can't ever tell there's a, a splice in the middle there if it's done right, unless you get up and, and really look at it close. Uh, OK Brand would be another company uh, out of Oklahoma there, and they have publications as well. So when we talk about braces or corners, the publications tend to call them braces. I think a lot of producers, including myself, will call them corners. So I, if, you, if you hear me say corners, that's what we're really talking about there. It kind of comes personal preference, whether you want to do pipe or wood. Personally, I like pipe corners uh, better, and I like a double pipe corner here. So these are actually some pre-made uh, double pipe H braces that were um, some of the pipe companies will have these manufactured that you can buy them directly. So uh, save some welding and some fabrication there. Or, or if you're, you're good at welding and like welding, you may just buy the components and, and build those yourselves. But either way, that's one option, just showing you a, a double H pipe brace there at the end with the gate hung off of it. Um, for some pipe braces, you'll see people run an angled pipe for the second one versus an H. I really can't find any difference as far as strength between running that angle if we're using pipe versus just straight. So personally, um, the last set of fences we built, I just put straight double H's in them. We didn't, didn't run any angles on them. Um, if it's going to be a real tall fence, so if you're putting up a deer proof fence or something like that, you probably are going to have more than one horizontal pipe going across there. A big thing when you're building corners, whether you're building them out of pipe or whether you're building them out of wood uh, with wire, is you need to have that brace wide enough. Okay. And so the rule of thumb is you want the brace at least two and a half times the height of the fence. So if you just thought about if you're gonna put a fence four foot high, then four times two and a half, you would want that brace to be at least 10 foot wide. And so you can see here, this is actually for a five foot fence. So they made it even a little wider, uh, 13 foot here to make sure they keep at least that two and a half times there. And that's important to give that fence the strength we need on the end. Um, if you are going to use wood and then wire to go across, you got to have a, a cross member here, but you also have to have wire to have pressure on there. The angle of this wire is actually important. And this is something from the Stay Tough publication there um, is if you get this angle too low, it actually reduces the strength of that brace. The other thing is you got to pay attention what side you put it on, because depending on what direction the fence is going, depends on what end needs to be the top and what end needs to be the bottom. OK, one question that came in is if we're talking about like back over here, these pipe corners, would I put those in concrete? Absolutely. Uh, put them in concrete. The one thing, though, is sometimes we have a tendency to put too much concrete Really, we only want to put concrete at about the bottom third of the hole. And, and we'll talk about this again here in a minute. 
and then cover it up with dirt. We don't want to actually put concrete all the way to the top. That actually weakens it. So putting that concrete at the bottom creates an anchor and then all that dirt on top of it weighs it down and really helps prevent those from pulling out of the ground. Um, again, just showing you if you're going to have single H braces, um, you know, and you have a taller foot, you're going to have to have a really long span between those two. And then depending on which direction that fence is going, you got to make sure you, you, you put the brace wire there and put a tensioner. Like I said, personally, instead of the, the brace and then the, the wire, I like just a solid pipe, H or double H there. One of the nice things about the double H's is compared to a single H brace is they will actually support more force, okay? Uh, so you can see here if the fence is pulling this direction, how we need to build those and how that wire needs to go both directions. You'll see on some old fences people built, they, they put an X here. That really doesn't help you. Uh, you need to make sure you get it done this way so you carry those forces correctly going back to that end post. Now, if you're gonna put it in the middle of the fence, and so you're gonna have fence on both sides, we'd do it like this. So you have the end post in the middle and then a brace post on each end. And so you run that wire a little bit differently. Um, again, if it's all pipe, you don't have to worry about that. That would be more if you put wood uh, braces in. Now, sometimes we're in a situation where we have to make a, a sharp corner or, or maybe a pretty sharp curve. And so there's some different ways to do this. Again, some of it comes down to personal preference. Uh, if you look here, uh, obviously a, a corner there, this was a fairly short run uh, in this situation, just a, a, a little holding trap around working pins. Uh, there's a little advantage of putting this brace pipe on the inside versus the outside. I guess two different advantages. One, if you think about where that fence is pulling, part of it's pulling this way, part of it's pulling this way. So if that purse is going to come up by having the brace pushed back against it, that helps it a little bit more than having that brace or a dead man out in the pasture, in my opinion. The other nice thing is from equipment standpoint, if you wanted to cut hay in this pasture, which I'll tell you, this is our family operation here and we do cut this field for hay at times. I, I much preferred to have this brace on the inside of this little holding pin than I did outside it. Just one less thing to get in the way when we're cutting hay. Uh, so just things to think about in that situation. And since this is a really short stretch, we just had a single H versus a double H going in each direction. All my other corners would have double H's in them. So we've already kind of talked about the pipe versus wood. It, it, it becomes personal preference. Just looking at old fences, it definitely seems to me that the, the pipe works much better long-term than what the wood is, but that's personal preference. Do, do what works best for you. Uh, the question about concrete came up, and, and this is one I'll tell you as a kid, we, we probably didn't do it the best way because we had a tendency to, to fill those holes up too much. Uh, but as you learn more and see more things uh, with the concrete, we really only want to fill that hole about a third full of concrete. Like I said, it basically serves as an anchor there with all that dirt on top to keep it from pulling out of the ground. If you put the concrete all the way to the top, you really don't have anything holding it down. Uh, so that saves money, but it also makes a stronger fence. So something to think about there. When we think about T-posts, there's some various things to consider. So one of those is the weight or how heavy that T-post is. So you'll see T-posts that'll either be 1.25 pounds per foot or 1.33 pounds per foot. So the two on the left here, the 1.25, the one on the right is 1.33. Uh, obviously the 133s cost a little bit more. Uh, I will tell you when we're looking at a permanent fence installation, I, I don't think we want to get too hung up on trying to save some pennies there. If it means a field, that, a fence that may not last as long, 
I'll tell you the last uh, fences we've built, uh, I've used a 1.33 post on all of them. There are paint differences between brands. Uh, you may have a color preference. I'll tell you the, the last post we bought, I uh, didn't get so much worried about color. We figured out where we were gonna get them uh, and looked at which ones we thought had the best paint coverage on them. And we made uh, the decision that way. In addition to the weight of those posts, obviously we have differences in height. Uh, for most of the fences we're building, which a lot of times we're talking about a fence somewhere in that 48 to 50 inch range, I'd go with at least a six uh, and a half foot post there. Uh, personally for me, a six is just a little short. If you're getting taller, you would need to even get bigger uh, with those posts so that you can leave plenty of that T-post in the ground, but still have plenty of it up above. Um, and then when it comes to boss post and boss post is, is just a pipe post in the middle, there's different recommendations out there. Um, the recommendation from this company here is, is they're talking a, a four to one ratio, but part of that's gonna depend on your spacing. I'll tell you personally, I didn't get so worried about the, the ratio of T post to boss post. We went in and put our boss post every hundred foot. Now, what about spacing on those T post? Uh, and obviously that's gonna have a pretty sizable impact on what your fence is gonna cost you. That's one of the advantages of the high tensile fence versus a low tensile fence is with high tensile, we can definitely space those T post out quite a bit further. Uh, these are just one set of recommendations from one of the companies. Uh, so they're talking with low tensile fence, uh, typically eight to 12 foot, a lot of people put them at 10, but then with high tensile fence, you can easily get out there to 20 or 30 foot uh, between those posts. Uh, and that kind of comes down to personal preference in your situation, but the important thing to realize is Low uh, tensile wire, you got to go closer together. High tensile wire, you can space those T posts out quite a bit more, and that's going to have quite a bit of impact on cost. Another thing is connecting the T post or the wire to the T post. And one thing to keep in mind there is if you've spent some money to get wire that has a heavier coating on it from a resistance standpoint. Think about the coating of the clips you're gonna use. And, and a lot of times the clips that come with the T-post don't have very good coating on them. So some of the companies do have some different clips they designed. This is uh, one from Stay Tough. It does have the same coating on it, similar to what their fence does, depending on what, what fence you buy, but it has a heavier coating. And these are actually designed to be a little quicker to install where there's actually a, a device that goes on the end of your drill. You put these two ends in there and it twists it on there. Uh, I will tell you, this is what we've used on the last fence we put up and much, I'm, I'm very happy with those compared to these traditional clips that just come with the T-post. I think it puts a little less pressure on the wire uh, and holds it on the fence better and we're actually quicker to install. Um, so pros and, you know, cons, we, we did have to buy those versus the free ones, but thinking about the longevity of the fence, I thought that investment was probably worth it. One question that comes up and one thing that will sometimes make you scratch your head when you're driving down the, the road is what side of the T-post should the wire go on? And when we're talking about cross fences, it really doesn't matter. But when we're talking about perimeter property fences, it, it does make a big difference. And we want the wire to go to the inside of the post. So anytime that cow was to push on that wire, the wire is pushing on the post versus if it's on the other side of the post, it's just that clip holding it. So definitely think about that on perimeter fences, you want the wire on the inside of the T post there. When we think about cost considerations, uh, when we're buying wire and when we're buying posts, it's just generally gonna be price relative to price. So um, a lot of times the high tensile wire, because we can go with the smaller wire with greater breaking strength will actually be cheaper than some of the low tensile wire that's heavier gauge. 
so keep that in mind when you're pricing it and don't just write off the high tensile wire because you assume it's more expensive. It, it, it may be the same cost in a lot of situations, actually cheaper. Um, just to share with you what we did on the last fences I built, uh, and this was both perimeter and cross fences. We used pre-made uh, double pipe corners. We put in on the pipe corners, the fences we built now versus the fences I built with when I was a kid, we've dropped down to much smaller pipe on those corners. So the pipe corners were two and seven eighths. I believe the bosses were two and three eighths. Whereas when I was a kid, we were using uh, four inch pipe corners. Now I will tell you, especially on the corners, we did use a little thicker wall pipe there. So that's something to keep in mind, just depending on what you're buying. But we use pre-made double pipe corners there. We put a uh, pipe boss post every 100 foot. I use 949 six field fence, 12 and a half gauge high tensile with that class three coating. We use six and a half foot T post uh, that were the 1.33s. Um, and I will tell you on the perimeter fences, I spaced my T post a little closer than what I really needed to. We spaced them over 15 foot, so not as close as low tensile barbed wire where we would space those over 10 foot growing up. Uh, but the reason I went 15 versus 20 or even 25 was from a pig consideration standpoint. Uh, for our property, we're fortunate. We typically don't have pigs that stay there all the time. They pass through. Um, and so we went ahead and spaced those T-posts a little closer together just to help try to prevent some of those pigs from coming on the property. Uh, and we've had those fences in there probably six or seven years now, and that worked really well. So it cost me a little bit more, but, but I was happy with that decision of putting those posts a little closer together there. And then we did for each T post, we put seven clips per post and I used those new style clips that had that better uh, coating on them. One thing we did a little bit different is a lot of times on top of net wire, you'll see people run bob wire, and that's just to help keep those cattle from, from leaning over on it. If it's tall enough, you don't have too much problem leaning over anyway. But instead of using bob wire, I actually ran electric fence on top. Um, because with bob wire there, they will still lean over at times. Uh, with electric fence, you eliminate that. It works really well to help keep those bulls in the right frame of mind as far as not thinking about jumping that fence or going through that fence. And then it worked really well to carry our electric fence to uh, further pastures in the property if we wanted to ever connect temporary electric fence to that from a strip grazing strand point or something like that. So we went with one strand of high tensile electric on top instead of bob wire. I'm very, very happy with that decision. If you go with bob wire, you have to think about one wire versus two wires. I would tell you, I would probably, especially from a wildlife standpoint, lean to one strand of bob wire versus two strands of bob wire. Two strands of bob wire, I just really don't think that's going to help you much from a cattle standpoint. And it does increase the risk of when those deer are jumping that fence to potentially get their leg tangled in there. So those are some things you just have to, to think about and make that decision for yourself. But looking at all the factors, that's the way we built the last set of perimeter fences and even one or two cross fences we built. Uh, and I've been very happy with that decision. Looking at some electric fence considerations now, there's a lot of different options there. Make you aware of some resources. There's a company called Premier One Fencing that sells multiple different brands of products and chargers. And they actually test a lot of these chargers before they sell them. So they can be a really good resource for more information as well if you wanna purchase some products from them or you may look at research and then purchase a local product as well. This is just showing you a lot of the different energizers or chargers. I know you can't read these numbers, that's fine. I just want you to see that they have uh, comparisons of all these different companies as far as how much joules they put out. And, and joules is the way we measure the energy 
of an electric fence charger, uh, how they may perform in more of a green grass situation versus a dry grass situation. And there can be some major differences in chargers there. Um, I'll just uh, uh, point out this one here called the, the cube. You can see it does much better in dry conditions than a lot of these other ones, 1.24 versus most of the rest of these are under 0.5 or 0.6. And even some of these that have a, a lot of output in green grass don't do real good in dry conditions. And so that's something to really look at when you're purchasing chargers. And then do you want one that works off of 110 only, or do you want one that will work off of 110 plus a battery, or do you want solar options? So a lot of different things to look at. And so having everything in one spot where you can look at it can be really handy. Another company that makes a lot of different products, especially when we think about insulators is uh, Dare. And so you can get their catalog and look at all their different products. And we'll look at some various products here in a minute. One of the big things with an electric fence is understanding how that works. So the way electric fence works is you have your charger and that charger goes out to your wire and it actually carries that charge. When that animal hits it for it actually to get a shot, it has to make contact with the wire it has to make good contact with the ground and a circuit has to be completed. So we have to get this coming all the way back to your ground rod here and send back up to the charger. If you don't have a, a closed loop there, that animal won't get shocked in that situation. And so a lot of times when we see failures with electric fences is because they don't have a good enough ground rod system here. The more ground rods you put in, the better off you're going to be. The bigger charger you put in, the better off you're going to be. So make sure you, you get a really good ground rod system in there. This is just another way of showing it. So you'll see when you start looking at some of these company publications, you see all three of these wires are marked as live. They're all meaning they're carrying a current. We'll look at a ground wire here in a minute but we have to have that animal touch the fence. We have to have that charge go back through the ground, back to our ground rods and back into our charger there. Um, the bigger the charger, the more ground rods you need. If you have drier conditions, you're gonna be better off with ground rods as well. Uh, I will tell you personally, uh, the last time I put ground rods in, in the ground for a, a new charger I purchased, uh, I actually put six six foot ground rods in, in the ground as little work to get that done, but have been very, very happy with that. Even with dry conditions, that fence has performed extremely well. Uh, question was, are T posts not a good ground? So for very temporary electric fence, a T post is reasonable, but any kind of semi-permanent fence, you're gonna be much, much better off with a galvanized ground rod that are driven deep into the ground. Uh, so that what we're talking about here with these ground rods is they're six foot long and they're driven in the ground all but about six or eight inches. So the deeper we can get them in the ground, the better off we're gonna be. So if it's just a very temporary electric fence and the, the T-post may work okay, any kind of a permanent fence um, where we can get good ground rods, you, you're going to be much better off. So hopefully that answered that question. If not, go ahead and, and chat back in and we can visit some more. But I, I can't emphasize that enough. Another thing is, um, is if you can get those ground rods in an area that maybe holds water a little bit better. So maybe if they're, you know, you have a barn with a slope roof and you can get out away from it, but where that water runs and so it stays wet a little bit longer in dry conditions, that could be advantageous to you in those situations. Uh, so, so just think about that. And then when we think about connecting those ground rods back to the charger, typically I'll show you here in a minute, but we'll use what we call a double insulated wire to carry that, that back to the charger.
So question came in, will the PowerPoint be available to download? The PowerPoint itself won't be the, we, I will, uh, assuming everything goes right with the recording, have this recorded and we'll post it to the YouTube channel. If you want a copy of the PowerPoint slides, if you will email me, I'll be happy to send you a PDF copy of the PowerPoint slides. Um, this is just showing you another option. So if we get in real dry conditions and we're not getting that charge carried back through the ground entirely, what you can do is have one, what we would call live wire, okay, that has the charge going through it. And then what we would call a ground wire, or some people may call it a fence return wire. So it helps get that charge carried back. And so what you would have is that ground wire connected to a separate ground rod. And so we get it deep into the soil where we get some more moistures. So it goes back to the ground rods tied into our charger. Some people sometimes will take this and, and tie it directly back to the ground rod, just depending on how your, your system's set up. I, I'll tell you personally, and we're in an, an average of a, about a 35 inch rainfall area. But even drought of 2011 and the drought we've been under since December of this year, I haven't needed to run a ground return wire because I, I spent that extra effort of, of putting those extra ground rods in and getting them deep in the ground. Uh, even when I have fence uh, three quarters of a mile away from my charger, we've still got along uh, good in those situations. But if you are in real dry sandy soils, that is another option for you. So one question came in about galvanized rods versus copper ground rods. Um, most of the time we will use galvanized because that's what the fence is gonna be. And really we wanna try to keep the fence and the ground rod the same material if we can. Plus from a cost standpoint, the galvanized are quite a bit cheaper than the copper. If you want to use a copper ground rod, that's okay. Again, that's one of those things that comes down to personal preference. Uh, I've used galvanized in all of my setup. The other thing we have to think about is the volts we need to kind of help keep animals in varies a little bit by species. And so just some general recommendations uh, out there two to 3,000, and I would tell you this would be more for, for cows here, bulls we probably want a little closer to, well, actually they said here 4,000, I'm gonna tell you that's what personal experience has been. Sheep and goats, you need a little bit more because they weigh less, and so they don't ground as well, so, so you do need a little bit more charge there. Um, and then depending on what species, you can see some different recommendations as well. I will tell you it is worth investing in a voltmeter. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You can pick up a pretty nice simple one for about $35. It's real handy when you're trying to evaluate the fence. It tells you a whole lot more than just stripping the ends off of two pieces of, or stripping the end, both ends off of a piece of wire and seeing how big of a spark you can throw there. Uh, that, that voltmeter works very well and you're just gonna clip one end to the wire, stick the other end into the ground um, and check it and it, it'll give you a readout there. I will tell you a lot of times when I'm checking, I'll, I'll cheat and instead of bending all the way over and sticking this end in the ground, I'll clip this end to the T post that's close there or my electric fence post that's close there and then just take this end and touch to the wire and it works just fine. But but either one of those options work, but spending a little bit of money on a voltmeter is, is a really nice thing to have. A huge thing to think about with electric fence is the resistance. So how much of that charge do you lose over time? And the material impacts that as well as the gauge of the wire. So you can see resistance and the lower the resistance, the better off you're gonna be. So the bigger the wire, the lower resistance. So you can see just going from 10 gauge wire to 14 gauge wire, that big difference on how much resistance we have there. Less resistance is better. If you're using a poly wire, it is not all created equal. So really make sure you're looking at what you buy. So 
Um, this happens to be from speed right, just showing you some differences here. So in what they call their regular polywire, six stainless steel strands, if we look at resistance, 11,000 ohms per kilometer, which is not very good at all. A really nice way to look at this is voltage at the start of the fence, voltage at one kilometer, or basically think about roughly a thousand yards. We went from 8,000 down to 550. If we look at this wire that's actually a tin copper wire, has much, much lower resistance, 105. So starting at 8,000 at a kilometer, we've only dropped to 7,100. So if you had experiences where some poly wire works much better for you than others, it's all about this resistance. So really look at that. Even if this costs you a little bit more, you're going to have much better performance in the long run. So it's not all created equal. Make sure you really look at that. Again, the Premier One fencing for poly wire, for rope, for tape, they have a chart where you can look at those things. So a really nice resource there. Another thing, if you're going to be moving some poly wire, a reel is a very handy tool. It's important to realize they make both geared and ungeared reels. Uh, so with the geared one, you don't have to turn it near as much to get that wire wound up. I'll tell you, uh, um, my dad and my neighbor learned this the hard way. I bought a, a reel and they really liked it. And so they didn't double check with me and they just went and bought another one that they thought looked the same. And they quickly realized that one of them was geared and one of them wasn't. So do pay attention to that when you're buying them and, and go ahead and, and get you a geared reel. Uh, it'll make it a whole lot easier to wind it up. I mentioned double insulated wire before. So this is really good for connecting your ground rods back to uh, your charger or sending your hot wire out from the charger to, to your, your regular wire there. Um, you can buy this at your local store or you can buy it online, uh, but really thick here. Um, and you'll see here, I actually use this in uh, to tie some of my insulators to some posts in some situations. And, and we've been real happy with that as well. So that's what I'm talking about right here. So here is on my netwire fence, my high tensile, and, and this is just that high tensile smooth wire you can get at your uh, local uh, feed store or tractor supplier or McCoy's typically. It'll uh, come in a really long uh, roll there. Um, and we just use the plastic insulator with double insulated wire connected back to the post. And instead of trying to twist that up, I just took a split bolt clamp and used it. Um, there's a couple advantages that I like using that double insulated wire here. Uh, one, it's heavy, thick wire, so I don't have to worry about it breaking. But the nice with the double insulation is I just have less chance of it grounding out here or burning through. Sometimes if you try thin insulated wire, sometimes you, you can get a little ground situation. So that's just something to think there. Um, and then carrying my charge to a gate uh, situation. Again, this is just double insulated wire with the end split off using a split bolt clamp to connect to my live wire, the split bolt clamp. And I'll show you a close up of this here in a minute to connect to the gate setup. Um, and then we just put a couple little twists in here just to hold and stabilize that. Haven't had any problems out of this setup, been very happy with it. Now you can take and twist this wire back on itself if you wanted to, just like what was done here on the field fence. We've used the split bolt clamps just because they're easier uh, to join that jumper wire in there or if we need to ever make any kind of repair or anything. So just personal preference in that situation. Just a little bit different view so you can see that a little bit better. I will tell you that the tails coming out of the backside of the split bolt clamp, we just bend those back around just so you don't have to worry about catching your hand or something on there as, as accidentally and getting a scrape. And then what this split bolt clamp is, is it's just a bolt with a nut, but that 
bolt has a split in it, so it sets over the wire, and then that nut tightens up so you get a, a real nice connection. And with everything being galvanized here, we just don't get corrosion there, and that's beneficial from the long-term standpoint of that fence. Um, if we look at the gate setup here, this is actually something I, I found online. I've been real happy with, so it's made to hook multiple gates in here. We kind of modified it a little bit. Um, it's, it's designed to be screwed into a wood post. Obviously, I, I told you I like the pipe corners better. So we just took some scrap two by four, some strapping, strapped that on there and screwed it too. Ran my jumper wire down here, connected with the split bolt clamp that comes here that will actually fit in that hole or you can get a regular one and just drill the hole out a little bit. And then you have a nice little latch here for your gate so that you can run that electric fence past the gate in that situation if you want to. A little closer view of that. On gate handles, there's a lot of different options out there. You'll find some you like better than others. Over time, at least for me, the, the ones that are designed like this with the, the uh, solid ends versus a flat end on them have, have tend to help hold up a little bit better. So that's what we've used in most situations. And so if I need to go through this gate here, I can unhook the electric fence gate and then go through the gate. Uh, and then rehook it, and then I, I carry my electric fence charge to the uh, next permanent fence there. Just showing you a little closer view of that split, split bolt clamp uh, with a jumper wire going through there connected to the hot wire. As far as mounting onto your boss post, uh, what we ended up doing, these are actually designed for chain link fence. We just trim the back of them off and use one of the clips that we would tie the wire to the post width to hold the insulator on there. Um, the one downside is you got to get that wire strung through there before you tighten it because with those teeth there, you know, you're not going to work, work it through later on like you would with the pin lock that I'll show you here in a minute. Uh, but that's worked well. Uh, for us, that's that's been a permanent installation we really hadn't had to mess with. Um, just using a regular insulator here. Now I'll tell you, these are some that, you know, just clip onto the post that you have to feed through. I already had these on hand, so we used them. If you were buying some, instead of this design, I would buy a pin lock. And a pin lock just has a little pin that you lift up and down and you can put the wire in and, and put the pin back through to hold it. If you do ever need to run electric fence on the back side of T-posts, they do make insulators that will fit the back side that you can use in that situation. This is just showing you a pin lock so you can get these for T-post as well. Um, this one screws into a post here, but what's nice about this is you can lift this little pin up pull that wire out if you needed to, uh, push that wire back in and drop the pin. So if I was buying new ones, instead of using this, I would have bought pin locks there, but I already had those on hand. So I used what I had. Uh, with electric fence, cutouts are really handy. Uh, I would put some of those in in various places throughout your property. So if you do have a problem, you can turn that cutout off and isolate that problem a whole lot quicker. Uh, this setup is actually going to a gate that, that's down here if you're wondering why that's hanging there. Uh, for a temporary situation, if you wanna build a, a little gate into some temporary setups, they do make these insulators that work pretty well that screw on to a T-post. You can run whether it's poly wire or lightweight aluminum wire here and connect that. And then you have a gate handle on the other side. Uh, I won't tell you where this picture is at. It's not on my property, uh, but if you're in this situation where your fence has been down long enough, where those animals are comfortable standing right there, you're not gonna be happy with your electric fence program in the long run. Once you get track cattle trained to it, if you keep it hot the majority of the time, 
they'll get where they were respected and, and won't mess with it, but you do have to keep it up and make sure it's working. Uh, last thing I wanted to spend just a couple minutes on is thinking about gates. Uh, obviously in high traffic areas, go ahead and spend a little bit of money and, and get you a gate and put in there versus putting a, a wire gate in there. Uh, I think most of us will like that much more uh, in the long run. And then even on some of our perimeter fences, you know, gates don't cost us that much when you look over the life of the fence uh, versus that net there, um, and, and that can help. The other thing is, in this situation, I mentioned from a pig standpoint, my this is actually property line. The pigs come from this property in the background and come on to us. So what we've done here, I don't have it in this picture, but we put regular gates, and then we went in here and tied cattle panel to the bottom two foot of that gate to keep those pigs out, and that's worked really well in that situation. Uh, depending on where you're gonna be using gates, realize there's different weights and strengths of gates. If it's not you know, something you're gonna be using very often, then uh, maybe an economy gate's okay. Uh, I'll tell you probably in most situations, and I, I actually put bull gates in my perimeter fences, but a bull gate or a, a D style gate would probably be better. And, and definitely in, in corrals, you wanna go with a heavier gate. So just realize that they make different weight gates and, and you get what you pay for in that situation. Another thing when you think about gate size is what kind of equipment are you gonna be driving through there? So make sure you make it plenty wide. And in some situations you may decide you actually wanna hang two 12 foot gates in those situations to give you plenty of room. Uh, so just think about that ahead of time as you're building those fences and, and give yourself plenty of room to get equipment in and out. So that's what I wanted to talk about from a fencing standpoint. Hopefully that'll give you some various options and things to think about both from a perimeter or a permanent fence standpoint, as well as more permanent and temporary electric fence. So any questions anybody has about that topic or any other topics? Um, so there was a question in here on any experience with e-fence and I'm assuming that's uh, related to virtual fence. And what that is, basically, if you haven't seen that in a publication or something, it's a collar an animal wears, and then you can set up through a computer software system kind of boundaries. And as cattle get towards that boundary, it gives them a little buzz or a little shock to kind of keep them in a certain area. I don't have any personal experience with that. I'm going to tell you in most of Central Texas and East Texas, I don't think that's going to have a lot of application. If we get into really large range environments where there's not other cattle around and uh, really large pastures, that may be an option moving forward. There's a lot of testing going on with those products. I think there's still some things they probably need to work out as with anything is we have more time that they, they get better. But in some of those range environments or in some of our uh, Bureau of Land Management country out west, that may be something we, we see some use. Um, but in East Texas, I, I, I really don't see it having a lot of application. Okay, one question that came in is what about driving uh, post in uh, versus putting them in the ground with concrete. Uh, both can work. Um, the corners, I, I kind of like putting them in with concrete a little bit better just because it create a little more of an anchor there. And obviously if you're buying prefab corners, you have to set them in concrete. If you're going to completely build them, then you can drive them. Uh, I, I will tell you in the last fence we had built in I made the decision and I'm happy I, I did. We tore down all the old fence and cleared it off, but then I decided it was cheaper um, and it was better to pay somebody to build the fence than me build it just from a time management standpoint. So we had somebody build it. So we cemented the corners in because they were free prefab, but all my boss post, we had those driven into the ground. Uh, so I think either one of them can work, just kind of a personal preference there. Any other questions? Yes, sir. 
thank you again for this program. This is very informational and helpful. Um, for as far as electric fence for a, I would call it a semi-permanent application between, we have some family land that, um, you know, have we have two different herds. Um, is, is electric fence something that could be uh, implemented, you know, on a, on a semi-permanent or long-term basis between two different herds? Yeah, definitely, especially if it's a family situation like that, I, I think you're fine. I would just make sure you have good corners and I would use uh, like 12 and a half gauge high tensile electric. So what I used on the top of my permanent fences, I would use that in between the properties. So not the poly or because- it's gonna be pretty permanent. I would not use poly yeah. and I would not use aluminum. I would use this high tensile here. Okay. It'll actually cost less and you won't break it. You may pop an insulator off from time to time, but you're not gonna break it in that situation. Okay. So that's what I would use. Now, but you can have a good corner. If that if that electric fence is going to it, it doesn't follow existing fence lines. So it, it will go across, you know, an open pasture. Is that something like a, a two or three strand? If you're trying to separate different herds, I would do three strands in that situation. If it's just your personal cattle, I'll Agreed. tell you a lot of times we'll just one run one strand yeah. uh, to separate animals in that situation. If they're broke to the fence, that, that works well. Okay, thank you. When you are hanging gates, um, you do wanna take the top hinge and have it turned upside down. The reason being is because if you have both of those hinges pointed up, an animal can put their head under that gate and they'll lift it right off the hinges. So to do them correctly, the bottom one is up and the top one is down to keep that uh, in place. Any other questions? All right, well, I think we'll go ahead and call it a night then. I uh, appreciate everybody joining. Hopefully you have a good day and hopefully most of you got some rain and if you didn't, you'll get some shortly.